Good morning. Uh, today we'll be discussing programmable logic, and uh, it's our last last lecture. So, uh, just a, a reminder about the exam dates. Uh, there are two dates. It's already open in the course system, and uh, one will be on fifteenth of January, and the second of uh, will be in eighth uh, of February. Uh, both exams start with the written part, and this is from 8 o'clock in room 334. It's for one hour, and uh, there are two calculations, randomly selected out, out of the ones available in the book, or similar ones. And uh, after this, my colleague will have to correct the, t the, the results, will, he will tell it to me. And uh, the oral session will start at, let's say, 9.30, 10 a.m., um, based on how fast he is able to, to correct the exam. Okay? Good. So, programmable logic. Programmable logic is uh, something where we will see, again, logic function. So, we will work with gates, we will work with uh, tables, truth, functions, and, and so on. Uh, the principle of uh, programmable logic is uh, very simple. All logic functions can be expressed uh, just by using uh, ands or, or nors. So uh, we can uh, convert all functions uh, that uh, we have into an array of uh, some elements of basic elements, whether it's an AND or an OR function, and uh, we may create any function with this. So all this, what you see here, uh, will be part of the programmable logic, and uh, we will see how this is implemented in integrated circuits and uh, for what applications can those programmable logic circuits can be used. Uh, first of all, some history. Uh, programmable logic is a relatively recent uh, invention. Uh, it was invented around 1970, uh, where uh, it was created as uh, read-only memories for microcontrollers. Uh, then, uh, 1975, uh, it was renamed and ad new functions were added. Uh, and it was called programmable uh, field programmable logic array. Uh, the word word field means that you do not have to program it uh, in the factory, but uh, that you may reprogram the circuit uh, also uh, in the application. So if you need to update the software to change something to add some new functions, uh, then the field programmable logic arrays were possible to reprogram. Uh, the programmable read-only memories uh, were programmed only once. Uh, so uh, once you created the program, it was not possible to change it and you needed to replace the chip because it was programmable only at one one at the beginning. Uh, then other manufacturers started to follow. Um, today, the company Xilinx is the biggest company that produces those those chips. Uh, uh, second is Altera, and third is Lattice. Uh, I have some examples as, as circuits. But they all use the same philosophy, so uh, it is some combination of uh, logic elements that you are able to connect somehow, so that it corresponds uh, to your function and you are eventually also able to reprogram it in the application. So, uh, let's take a look on uh, what options do we have in programmable logic. Um, this is just a basic chart, but uh, we will, of course, not go through all the functions. So, uh, here uh, you see this is the group of programmable logic devices, and there are many uh, other options that we have. Uh, here are the field programmable gate arrays. This is the most advanced element today. Uh, 
uh, we will discuss it, of course. Uh, we will discuss also the CPLD, that stands for Complex Programmable Logic Device. Uh, and uh, we will also discuss just some of those other functions so that you know uh, how those devices have developed. We will not discuss all the functions, but for example here the PROM is the programmable read-only memory. So this is what was initially the beginning, uh, the, you know, the logic memories. So the principle of all programmable logic is very simple. Uh, we want to create some logic function and uh, we have some elements that are available in the, uh, in the chip. Uh, those elements uh, may be uh, and and array, so and functions or uh, functions as well, and uh, they may be combined in a different way. So uh, some uh, programmable logic devices have uh, an and array here that is programmable. Some have an array that is fixed, and the same here. Some some other manufacturer has uh, this array that is fixed and this is programmable and some other one will have this programmable and this fixed or both will be programmable. Um, it depends on the uh, complexity of the manufacturing process. Uh, so today you may have all programmable, but historically it was not, it, it would have been too expensive. Uh, so we have will have some inputs. This will be our logic signals that we have so from some application. Uh, it may be some signal from a sensor. Uh, it may be a signal uh, from some controller. It may be some signal that is coming from some feedback loop in our application. Uh, we want to do something with those signals. So we will program those arrays and we will have some output. So th those output signals uh, will be uh, going back to the application. It may be a control for the motor. It may be control for traffic light and so on. So uh, all logic functions can be created uh, as a sum of products. So we will have an OR array that will do the sum function. And here uh, the AND array that will do the, the multiplication. Or we can reverse that and we uh, can have an OR array and an AND array here. And this, this will be uh, the difference between the different categories that you see here on this picture. For example, PALS and PLAs, they have this rearrangement uh, done in a different way. Uh, we will start with historically one of the oldest uh, chips, which was the PLA, that stands for uh, programmable logic array and uh, you see it has the same structure there is an AND array here and an OR array here and in this case both the arrays were programmable uh, so uh, the advantage is uh, that uh, you have a very efficient architecture because you can create many functions but uh, the disadvantage is that you have those two programmable arrays, which at the time uh, was difficult to manufacture, uh, to program it and to test it. Uh, the reason for the difficulty is that uh, you start with a logic function and uh, when you are uh, transferring this logic function into the combination of AND and ORs, uh, you need to select, for example, which uh, element will be used for what part of the function. This is the task of the uh, compiler, let's say, that, that you use in during the programming. Uh, but uh, there are many options. Uh, you may have uh, the same function if you use the different, different gates. But then it may happen that uh, if you want to add something or if you want to make it more advanced, then you will not have enough space uh, in, in the chip. So uh, this optimization takes a long time. I will have to talk about it a little bit later. So this is the structure of the PLA chip. So here you see we have uh, the ANTs and here we have the ORs. And this matrix 
uh, is uh, the uh, interconnection matrix that allows you to connect different things together. So here you have inputs. So this is drawn for uh, an example of four inputs. And here you have uh, four outputs. And uh, if, if, for example, uh, you want this input to be connected to this chip, uh, then you connect it here in this uh, in this um, in this matrix, uh, and uh, by choosing different inputs uh, to different gates, you may create the end part of your equation, and you may do the same here with the all part. I have uh, an image uh, image on the next slide. So and then uh, it will look uh, like this. This is not the PLA array, but it has the similar structure. You see those dots here, they represent the connection. So for example, uh, if I would use this same structure here in the PLA, and let's say I would connect this input to this end array, there would be a dot here, and there would be a dot here. And those dots uh, represent the programmable part. So this is an internal structure uh, that you need to reprogram. And this is working as a transistor most often uh, in the programmable, programmable logic. Uh, if it's not programmable, then uh, those dots will represent permanent connections uh, which will be created during the programming process. So uh, this is the PLA array created in around 1975. Uh, as I already said, the disadvantage at this time was that it was difficult to manufacture because you had two uh, programmable arrays and you needed a complex compiler uh, that was required to choose the connections here and the connections here. So uh, those chips uh, were uh, expensive and uh, not useful for applications where price was the, the major issue. So uh, there is a simple solution and uh, this simple solution is to use um, a read-only memory because it is using exactly the same principle. A read-only memory is memory that you program only once and then you can only read from it. So it is useful to, stu to store, for example, a computer program that you will never change again. Uh, it is using exactly the same principle. Here you have an AND array and you have an OR array. But now you see here this AND array is fixed and this OR array is programmable. So uh, we can create a limited number of functions but the advantage is that uh, we have to program only one array over here. The other one is fixed, so this will be uh, easier to manufacture because you just need to create this as a, a programmable array, but this is fixed and you create that at once during the manufacturing process. So here you see that we have a predefined connection. This is what the manufacturer has chosen and he has chosen that for example input A is connected uh, directly to those four gates. This is an inversion so here uh, will be A non and it's connected to, to those functions. So when uh, you design a function the compiler has to know all this and he has to compile the code correctly. So it means that if in your function you are using A directly, it is limited only to those ends. And here if you are using A non, it is limited only to those ends. So it is less universal than uh, the uh, previous PLA circuit, but it's easier to manufacture and it will be also, also cheaper. So the dots here are fixed and the crosses here are programmable. So here uh, you can create uh, the function. So for example, if uh, I would choose, let's say, x 
output here and I want that x equals um, let's say um, a non so I would have to choose this one from from some point here and then I have those four outputs available and here I need to uh, program those dots and it will be either on or it will be either off. So this is also used and it has one fixed array and one programmable array. And now we have the third option uh, and the third option is uh, when we will have the programmable and array and a fixed uh, or array. So this was created around 1978. Um, again the advantage is that uh, you have only one array uh, so it's less complex uh, but uh, on the other hand um, it's less efficient than the PLA architecture uh, you are able to create a lower number of functions with with all this so uh, you see that here uh, we have the ants which are programmable the programmable part is over here and again by creating the connections between the inputs and between those internal buses uh, we connect that to the ends and uh, here you see we have a fixed OR array at the output so uh, for example uh, those three ends are going to this OR and I cannot connect anything from this side to this OR so again when you are compiling the function uh, the compiler needs to take this into consideration and you have a limited set of options what you can create uh, in the function. Uh, I have here some examples that will demonstrate how this is done. So uh, for no reason at all I have chosen the PLA array. So here we have a programmable array here and here we have a programmable array at all uh, as well. So uh, I'm free to choose uh, my connections here and I'm free to choose my connections here. So let's say uh, I want to create the following function. So uh, y1 is one output and I want that it looks like this. d times b, so this is multiplication, plus a non times b times c non. So here you see that at the, the inputs they usually have also some buffers and inverters here so this is a buffer and this is an inverter so at the inputs I already have D here and D non and the same for the remaining inputs and uh, here I have the ANDs and here I have the OR function so how to do it so if I want to create these functions so then I have to create the multiplication of D and B so here I have the line for D so I will connect to my AND here with this dot the D and here is the B so those red dots will be connected and the other crosses will not be connected together and this happens during the programming if this would be a fixed array then I would already know uh, what options do I have? I would have some pre-selected uh, ANDs or ORs uh, in, in the gate array. So here this AND array, this on this bus, on this line, I will have the D times B. Now I have to create this term, A non times B times C non. So A non is, uh, is here, so this is A non. I have created this dot over there, then times B, which is here, and times C non. So the second part of this equation is here. So I have used those two ANDs to create this function. And then I need to sum those two parts together. So I create this connection, so you see Y1 here so the y1 line will be this one and I will connect this plus this and this will be the plus sign which is over there so the first equation uses two ANDs and uh, two 
here two connections and this is the output buffer. The second function a plus c times d non we see a so a is over there here this would be a and here I have chosen d and uh, d non and c and here this is the plus sign so this is the thing f coming from a and this is the equation part which is over there so if I would have uh, an array like this uh, then I would not be able to program any more functions because I have only two outputs over here I already use them all and uh, I still have around half of the chip available but I cannot use it for this function the same would be uh, if um, I would run out of the ands or of the ors functions here. So there is always some limitation and then uh, if this happens you need simply a bigger chip which will be more expensive of course. So this is an example uh, how this is done. Um, so this was around 1978 roughly and then the designers that use those chips they started to realize that they uh, want to be able to make more with those chips so uh, the simple fact that you have an AND array and uh, an OR array eventually both programmable uh, was not sufficient anymore so uh, the manufacturers they started to, to add more functionality in the chips and uh, they named it a complex programmable logic device uh, this is the, the name that the company Xilinx is using. Uh, the bonus that is added in this chip is uh, on the output. You see here we have some flip-flops. So uh, here you have the interconnection matrix. That so you may choose uh, what inputs you want where. Here you have the gates, so we have the and gates and or gates but here we have the additional flip-flop that we can use in a sequential logic if you look on this picture here we had ands and ors so we also may be using this uh, as a sequential function if uh, I create I connect some output as a feedback to the input externally I am able to create a sequential function as well but why not to create it internally I don't need any external connection on the circuit board so uh, th this is what is added in the flip-flop directly uh, you see here roughly the density uh, 50 to 200 gates roughly uh, today they are uh, more complex so you may have uh, thousands of gates inside of those chips but it started with this simple architecture and uh, here uh, the essentially just the bonus was that you were able to create quite easily uh, sequential functions the principle is still the same um, then someone came with the idea why not uh, to simplify this device uh, again and the simplification was uh, due to the advances uh, in um, integrated circuit manufacturing uh, and in the density of uh, the chips so it was possible to add more and more transistors at the same chip so this was what happened at uh, around 1985 uh, and uh, this is when the field programmable gate arrays were created the word field means that you are able to reprogram the chip programmable gate array still the same name and uh, it's still using the, the same philosophy uh, you have some gates so you see here we have uh, it some sometimes uh, in the books it's called also a sea of gates so we have gates everywhere in the chip and here you have the interconnection matrix so you have many many inputs you have some interconnection matrix that is inside of the chip 
again by connecting the vertical lines with the horizontal lines you can uh, create the connections and uh, you can uh, select that this will be one part of the logic function, this will be another part of the logic function and it will be interconnected somehow. Uh, of course you may find flip-flops also in uh, the FPGAs and you may find also some other functionality. I will talk just briefly about uh, what the extended functionality. And you see now how the density has increased. Now we have uh, over a million gates, even more, that is placed in a single chip. So uh, it is possible to create very complex logic functions. Uh, the advantage of all those programmable circuits is that uh, you are not limited by uh, a microprocessor. So for example, if you have a microprocessor it follows some program, some code. So it follows some lines in the code and uh, <coughs> it can do only one thing at a time. So you add something, you multiply something and then you have an algorithm that you need to follow. If you use an FPGA, for example, you may say, I want that this part of the FPGA is doing something with this part of my application. It is controlling the brakes, for example. I want that this other part of the chip is doing something else. It's checking for the buttons or controlling the radio or doing something completely different. And uh, there is no relation between this part and between this part of the chip. So uh, the biggest advantage of uh, FPGAs, but also the other chip, is that uh, you may program the functions independently. For example, if I go back to my example here, this will be one function controlling the buttons and this will be another function controlling the light, for example. So here, uh, this will be independent of the second function. And uh, the advantage is that you are only limited uh, by the speed of propagation of signal that is happening in the chip here. So you may optimize that, for example, you will use these inputs for one function then only this part of the chip and those will be the outputs for your application. And the signal does not need to travel from this input into that through all the interconnection matrix, do something here and then co connect back and, and uh, it, will be, it will be slower. So you may optimize your application in this way. Of course, uh, you do not optimize this by hand, but uh, in the compiler you say I want that maximum uh, propagation delay of my signal is 50 nanoseconds, for example, and it will try to optimize this for you. Of course, it's not possible always to, to do it, so you may run out of speed or even space in the FPGA if you use all the resources. Uh, so, you see, it's some gates and some interconnection matrix. Uh, there are other functions that uh, the designers requested. And uh, one of the functions was uh, to have some memory that the designer can use. For example, to store data or uh, for example, to create another logic functions. So uh, an FPGA it's a little bit different from all the previous examples. And the difference is that the ANDs and ORs are uh, typically not created as logic gates, but uh, they are created in uh, something that's called a lookup table. LUT stands for lookup table. Uh, a lookup table is nothing else than a memory chip. So uh, at this time, it was already possible to produce uh, memory blocks uh, that were able to work in industrial environment that were relatively cheap and uh, the ANDs and OR arrays were replaced with lookup tables. How does it work? Uh, let's say mm, this I will have an example with a lookup table with just two inputs. So let's say I have input A and I have input B 
So this gives me the option for outputs, and I may choose this randomly. So uh, internally, it is a memory chip, and I will say what should be the result if B is zero and A is zero. And the same for all other combinations. So I may choose an arbitrary logic function. So for example, uh, if I uh, design it in this way, 0, 1, 1, 0, just some arbitrary value, I will store those 1s and zeros in, uh, the, in the memory. And, I will, uh, and this is a logic function. So here uh, I can say, let's say this is, this is an output. Uh, and uh, I may say that the output y is uh, some combination of b and a. So this would be an example of uh, a logic function with two inputs. You can do this with an arbitrary value of inputs. So typically, uh, FPGAs uh, at this time used four inputs, a, b, c, d. So this was what this was creating the the combinational logic in the circuit, and this effectively replaced the ANTs and OR arrays. There is one small problem. Uh, if I go back to, to this, for example, or even this, uh, those connections, they are fixed when you program the array. So when you lose electrical power and you turn it on again, those connections are still there and you do not need to reprogram the chip. Uh, if you do it in an FPGA, this is a memory chip, it's a RAM memory, the same like you have in, in a PC today, and you need to reprogram again this function. So some manufacturers, they add uh, an additional memory uh, to the FPGA, when you power the device on, it reads the configuration into all the lookup tables and it, it's doing your function. Uh, in some cases, you uh, may update that uh, externally uh, through some communication. Uh, the advantage of this arrangement is that you are not creating the ends and all arrays, but you are just creating the memory cells. And as uh, you know, today we have uh, really large memories in the PCs, so uh, it's using the same technology, so it's cheap, relatively cheap, uh, and uh, it can have many millions of, of, of uh, the uh, memory cells inside of the FPGA. So this is the lookup table part. Uh, then we have the flip-flop part. This remains from the CPLD. And this D part allows us to create sequential logic. So we can have some, sequen some combination logic on the input here. And here you see we have some clock input and we have some reset input. So this may, this may be used to create uh, combination logic. And here, this block on the output is a multiplexer, and this multiplexer allows you to select what will go to the output. So here we have the output. This may go directly to the output pin, or it may go to the interconnection matrix. And you see here, I can select the output from the D flip-flop or directly from the lookup table. So if I want to create the uh, combination logic, I will select the output from the lookup table directly, and this will be disconnected, so there will be no signal going to the output. If I want to create uh, a sequential logic, I may use this D flip-flop, and I will select this, in this input to the multiplexer, and this will be disconnected. So it's a more universal device, and uh, you can create many functions with that. Uh, Later on, the designers, they found out that uh, they may use even more 
complex blocks in the FPGAs. So uh, today's FPGAs, they still have the basic core structure, which is, which is this. So lookup tables, D flip flops, multiplexers. Uh, they still have some interconnection matrix, but they have more functionality. Uh, for example, here you see we have block RAMs. So this allows you to store a relative large number of data. And um, you may have few, let's say, few megabytes maybe. And uh, this allows you to store something that you need to process here in this in these blocks. So uh, here we have the inputs and outputs. We may select what will be uh, the functionality. So uh, between the interconnection matrix we have something that's called an IL block. And this IL block uh, is there uh, to select if this is an input or if it's an output. Uh, eventually if it's bidirectional. Uh, what standard will I use? If I will use TTL, if I will use CMOS logic or any other standard that I want to use. So this happens in the IL block. Uh, then you still have the interconnection matrix which runs like this and allows you to interconnect the inputs uh, with the blocks together and the blocks together as well. And then we have a block RAM which allows you to store something, to retrieve something. Uh, so for example, if you process some data, uh, you may read from your inputs the data. Uh, you may store that in the block memory. Uh, you may say, okay, this part of the FPGA will later process the data, will do something with them, will filter it, and eventually output the signal to some other, to some, to some outputs. Uh, you see, it's typically divided into banks. Uh, the, the reason is that uh, if you would have, uh, it's a universal possibility to connect this block with this block, uh, the internal structure would be too complex. So uh, you see here we have one bank that has its own logic blocks, block memory and IO blocks. And uh, it's typically not possible to interconnect different things in, in, the, ba in the banks. So here are some other blocks that we may find in really modern, uh, modern FPGAs. Uh, so here we have the IO blocks. The IO blocks allow us to select what standard will we follow uh, and how should it communicate. Internally, uh, the FPGA needs to use one standard. So uh, this IO block will be used to translate from one standard to another one. You see here, uh, there are many, many options. Uh, we have discussed only one, let's say TTL here, low voltage CMOS, so we know this. But the other ones are different standards that are used for different applications. Uh, typically, uh, today's FPGA work with 20, 30, maybe 40 standards, and you may reprogram that. So for example, you see here, uh, we have uh, a PCI bus on 33 megahertz running on 5 volt, the same on 3.3 volts, 3.3 uh, uh, volts, 66 megahertz, and so on and so on. So this is the ion block. Here is the block memory. This is the logic block. And uh, you see here, we have uh, a special kind of uh, memory that is available in the FPGAs. Uh, usually, uh, the memory block looks like this. We have some memory block over here. And uh, you have some address bus. And then you have some data bus. So this is... Uh, the data bus for data transmission, input and output bus, and this is an ad address bus saying where you want to write or wha where you want to read from. Uh, if you have a memory like this, which is typical in, um, say, in normal devices like microprocessors, for example, uh, you can only write or read. So 
if I want to store something, I will put the address on the address bus and I will put the data on the data bus and I will say with some write signal that this is a write operation and it will store the memory. If I want to read from the memory, I will put the address on the address bus, I will send the read signal and it will output the data signal. So we can do only one operation at a time. But now imagine that uh, you want to really fast processing of the data and uh, you want to use it at the same time. So for example, you are acquiring some data from some sensors, you want to store that in the memory, and at the same time you already want to process the data with some logic blocks that you program over here. You cannot do this with this kind of memory, which is called uh, a single port memory. You have just a single port here, uh, which you can use either for write or read. Uh, for this reason, FPGAs, they use a more advanced kind of memories, which is called a dual port memory. And this means that uh, you have this address and data bus twice in the memory. So, uh, it looks like this. You have one memory, but you have two access ports. You have here and another access port that's called that A2 and D2, so we have more data buses and this allows you to read or write from one port and read or write from the other port. So typically one port is to use to write into the memory so this may come from the sensor, it, you will store the data in and then with some other speed you will be able to read the data with some other part of the FPGA. So when you do this application uh, one or several logic blocks, uh, they are handling the writes and another logic blocks are handling the, uh, the reads from the memory and the algorithm, what you do this with, with that. Uh, you see it's organized into relatively small memories, um, so the dual port memory uh, it's much more complex than normal memory, so it's limited in size you may have, let's say, one megabyte roughly uh, in the FPGA. Of course, it depends on type and price and so on, but it's not uh, that you have gigabytes of this memory available. Uh, then we have here uh, the clock management part of uh, the FPGA. Uh, this is used to create different frequencies that you use to clock the parts of the FPGA. For example, uh, you may say that one part of the F FPGA will run on one clock frequency and another part of the FPGA will run on a different frequency. For example, uh, I want that uh, my data is acquired with frequency of 1 MHz and then I have time because the data is short, I have only a few samples and then I have time to process the data with frequency of, let's say, 100 kilohertz. I'm just making up those values, typically it's much faster, but uh, it's possible to run different parts of the FPGAs on different frequencies. So this is the task of the clock management part. Uh, it's called DLL, which stands for Delay Locked Loop, it's, some kind, it's a kind of circuit that allows you to create multiple frequencies. Uh, you typically have one oscillator externally in the chip which runs on one frequency and you use this uh, to create different frequencies. Uh, so you divide the clock frequency, you multiply it eventually and you are able to uh, create a wide variety of frequencies, but it's not such that you may create any frequency. You are always limited by the division and multiplication factors that you have available. Uh, and the last block here is a distributed uh, logic and distributed RAM. Uh, the block RAM here is used to create large storage but once you use it, 
and even if you do not use it completely, you cannot use it anymore. So if I will use, for example, uh, a f let's say four kilobyte or four kilobit uh, block RAM, uh, I have up to four kilobit space, but I will occupy the input and output port so I cannot access it easily. Uh, if you, and of course you are, you, you have a limited number of the dual ports, board blocks. So uh, if you have some smaller application, you may use the distributed RAM, which is very close to the logic block, but it's, it's much smaller. It's typically uh, just a few bytes, uh, maybe uh, <coughs> maybe eight bytes, or maybe maybe 256 bytes, and it's relatively small. Uh, but uh, it's possible to use it also uh, in the application. So when you compile the, the code, uh, you s can say that here I want to use the, the block RAM because I want to store large amount of memory of data. Here I want to use the distributed RAM. It's smaller, but it will be sufficient for me. And uh, during the compilation process, the compiler tries to maintain all your requirements. Um, the compilation takes a really long time, so in, in many cases. Um, so it's not as easy to work with FPGAs because uh, you change something in the code, then uh, you want to recompile to see if it's working, if it's working, and then you need to wait 20 minutes or 50 minutes or 10 hours, depending on the size of the application. You then see that it's not working and you, you need to re redo it again. Uh, this is just an example of uh, one block that is in the FPGA. Here I want just to illustrate uh, what is available today. So here uh, we have uh, the output buffers. So you see this is the uh, programmable pin that goes to the chip outside. And here I can create uh, what standard do I need. Here we have some protection uh, for electrostatic discharge and so on. Uh, here we have the programmable output buffer, so this is just a circuit that is either on or off, and we may turn it on and we may turn it off. And all the part here is uh, the uh, internal part. You see, th in this case, it's a D flip flop, and uh, here this is the multiplexer, so I may select that the signal to this buffer goes from the D flip flop or it's going directly from somewhere else. Um, so, what can we do with the FPGAs? Um, an FPGA is an excellent device if you need to run multiple tasks in parallel. And mul by multiple tasks, I don't mean just two tasks at the same time, but um, ten or more. So, uh, we have the, the one equation, and second equation, and third equation, and they can all run in parallel with uh, a very high frequency. Uh, there are, however, some problems, of course, uh, and the problem is typically timing. Uh, if I want to add something with some other result, I need that those data are synchronized. If I would go back to my equation example here, for example this one, I assume that all this happens at the same time. But since the terms of the equation may be at different parts of the, of the chip, it will definitely not happen at the same time. So for example, if I take a look on this, here I multiply D times B, so with relation to the input, this is shorter distance to the output than here, because here this is longer. So if you are operating with large, high frequency signals, uh, even the smallest delay may be a problem because the, 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 the signal travels with a finite speed. So uh, what to do with it? For example, here, let's take a look on this. Uh, I have one function 
and here I do read something, do something here, and I have some output over there. So this will be one path. And here you, you have roughly the numbers, how, how long does it take. So it takes one nanosecond from the input to go to the circuit, then six nanoseconds to calculate the result, and then you see another one nanosecond here, 14 nanoseconds here, one nanosecond here. So in total, when I place that in one part of the chip, very close to each other, it will take 23 nanoseconds. However, if I select, or not me, but the compiler selects this, uh, that this part will be at one part of the FPGA, and this part will be at another part of the FPGA, so it will there will be a longer distance, then this still takes one and six nanoseconds, but then this path is long, it will travel from one side to another side, and it takes six instead of one, calculation is the same, and then this distance is longer for some reason, so then in total it may take a longer time. And this may change uh, if you recompile the program, because when you recompile the program, then uh, it may choose a different different paths. So you may constrain that, you may say, okay, I want that this is happening uh, within 30 nanoseconds, and then it will be okay. And then the compiler tries to rearrange all the elements so that it maintains your constraints. And this is the reason why it takes so long to compile with FPGAs, because it, there are millions of options how to rearrange all this. So here you see a third example. Here we can add a register, so that's another cell of the memory that will store the result. Here uh, we uh, have uh, about this, we have the same delay, so this takes 11 and this takes 18, so we still have the same uh, delay as we had previously, um, but this is sp now split into two separate delays. Uh, another option that we have in modern FPGAs is that uh, we may use an additional hardware that is available in the FPGA to do the calculations. Uh, in many algorithms, for example, signal filtering, uh, you need to do multiplication and addition. Of course, uh, you can do this with the lookup tables as well, but it will be relatively slow, and uh, for this reason, the manufacturers have added another functionality, uh, which they call a DSP slice. Uh, DSP stands for Digital Signal Processing, so this is more oriented into algorithms that process the signal. And uh, this adds the fast multiplication and addition into the FPGA. So we still have some inputs, A, B, C, D. Here we have some multiplication, we here we have some addition, and here uh, we may store the data into a memory part. And this DSP slice is uh, very good if you are working with uh, filtering algorithms, for example, because those algorithms, they typically sum the, s the samples, multiply them with some other coefficients, and then output the result. So uh, there is a limited number of uh, those DSP slices in the FPGAs, and if you run out of those, uh, then uh, you may use the additional logic that you have, but it will be definitely slower, so you need to limit your speed. Uh, the typical number of DSP slices is, let's say, between um, 50 and maybe 200, roughly, maybe larger, maybe, s maybe smaller. Uh, so it's not like millions of, of th those DSP slices. So we have millions of gates available, but a very limited amount of those DSP slices inside. So how do we work uh, with the FPGAs? Uh, first of all, uh, we need to design the algorithm. We need to know exactly what should it do. 
Uh, this is done in a programming language on a computer. So there are different programming languages that do this. Uh, then, so we create the algorithm. Uh, then we typically do simulation because simulation on a PC uh, runs relatively fast compared to the compilation. So we do not uh, compile the code, try it in the real FPGA because this would take a real long time. We run that in the simulator on a PC which just simulates if the function is, is correct. So we verify if uh, it's doing what it should do. But this simulation does not uh, consider any timing problems. So it does not consider any delays in the circuit. We just see, okay, it works or if it's not working. Uh, then we synthesize and implement the design, but it's still on the PC. And here we may use another software that is doing timing analysis. And timing analysis means that we verify if our design meets the constraint that we, that we need. For example, we want that all our application runs on a frequency of 100 megahertz. And this can be done in the timing analysis. If it will not meet the result, we need to go back to the beginning. We need to rethink our application, change the behavior, change the way we implement that. And we do this in a loop until we are satisfied. And at the end, uh, we create something that's called a bitstream, and this is what we download into the FPGA itself. And then we, of course, may do some hardware testing, and we may say, okay, this works or it doesn't work, and we need to go back to the beginning. So, uh, here are some typical steps that uh, you can do. So, it all starts with the algorithm. So, for example, uh, this is uh, a schematic uh, that you can draw in the software. And this schematic is doing just one thing. Uh, it's uh, taking the signal from an AD converter and it's co displaying that on the display. So, uh, here, this is a block that hides the logic functions. This is another block that hides the logic functions as well. Um, you may program this, this in, in a language that's uh, specifically for, for those programmable circuits. Um, sometimes it's easier to do it in schematics, but anyway, it will then be recompiled into, into some code. So here we see there is some input here and here, and here is some output. So this, this output will go to the IO block, this will go from the oscillator, to an IL pin and we'll do something with that. And this will be programmed inside. Uh, as I already said, the advantage is that all those blocks will run independently uh, in the FPGA on different parts uh, of, the, of the chip. So, for example, this is uh, the code for this, uh, for this uh, block and it's saying you if the input uh, is 0, 0, 0, 0, then the output will be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so on. So this is a typical code that you may find. Here I have uh, listed all the options that are available. So uh, this has four inputs, and uh, I am encoding that to uh, seven outputs uh, signal. So this is what I code, and then I re it's recompiled into the pieces of the FPGA, which you typically do not see. So this is an example of uh, the simulation. Uh, so for example, here you see we have the signals, and uh, the, those are the inputs, and this is the output. So uh, unless I define some signals on the input, uh, my output is still zero. And then here in such a chart, uh, I may see if uh, it's working like it should or if I should go back uh, to, my, uh, to my design and uh, redesign it so it, it's working or doing something else. 
When I do this, I recompile a result, for example, uh, so you see that it was successful. It means that it's able to fit into the device. It means that um, the device is large enough to work with my equations. And here uh, you can see uh, roughly uh, how much I use of the device. So, for example, I had a device uh, that had uh, 255 cells and I use 32 of them, 32 percent of them. But it doesn't mean that I still can use the remaining uh, 72 percent. It's limited in to uh, the uh, inputs and outputs that I have. In my case I use only 19 percent of the function blocks, uh, but if I add more functionality, I may run out of the interconnection matrix or the inputs or outputs. Um, so here you see an example. Uh, I had in total 108 pins available on the input, but I use only 14 and I use only one output out of three. So that's just an example. So what is the today's state of FPGAs. Uh, there are very large devices that can uh, work with very high frequencies. So this is an example like from, from last year, one of the largest one today, it's even larger. So it can run on up to 900 megahertz frequency. It's very fast. It has a really large amount of pins even 1,000 is possible. You see a relatively small amount of memory, but this is internal memory. It's the, the, the dual block memory. Here you see I have almost 2,000 DSP slices, so I can have uh, at least 2,000 multipliers and, addi and additioners uh, at the same time working in parallel. And you see one million of the logic cells. So different manufacturers, they have different ratios, they may provide you a larger amount of logic cells, a smaller amount of DSP cells, and so on. a good question but I don't know uh, definitely a question of price because those devices are really expensive Th this can cost like 10,000 20,000 check rounds so uh, it's really expensive if you destroy this chip then you you, you ruin uh, 10 or 20,000 uh, I I think that it may be better to have just one chip and more functionality on it. Um, the reason may be uh, reliability. Because if you want to, to solder multiple chips to a board, it may be less reliable than if you solder just one. But that's maybe just my opinion. Even, even from the uh, probably price point of view, uh, it may be less expensive to use just one larger device than, than to use more smaller devices. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, today, in FPGAs, you may already find integrated microprocessors. So, it's like a combination of uh, FPGA and microprocessor core. So even though you may program your microprocessor yourself in the FPGA, today the manufacturer provide you one or more cores that are already done in the FPGA. So you may have several microprocessors. They run in parallel. You may program the logic cells that will communicate with the microprocessor. And uh, uh, it will run all independently. So this part, for example, if these two logic blocks work with this processor and with this memory, then this part 
uh, is able to run independently on the other part, which may use this logic cells as memory and so on. So uh, an FPGA is a really powerful device. Uh, it is also quite expensive because of these capabilities. Uh, it's used in high-speed applications uh, where uh, you require parallel processing. So it's not a good idea to use it in, in a cell phone where you just follow the buttons that someone presses. Uh, but it's used in high-speed data acquisition systems. So I've just selected one example here. Um, so this was a measurement system for CERN. Uh, they say they needed to acquire 120 channels sample the data at 125 megahertz and do something with the data. Uh, we are using FPGAs here to control electric motors here. So it's it has the, the same advantage for us. Uh, we program the algorithm and the algorithm runs in parallel with the <laughs> other, other, other devices. So uh, for example, we acquire data from sensors, we process them somehow, uh, we run the control algorithm in parallel to that, uh, we control the motor, we read the sensors, we read the, the, the control from, from the PC, for example. So uh, FPGA is an excellent device if you want an algorithm that needs this parallel functionality. Otherwise, today, you should use a microprocessor. And it's also an excellent device for um, development or experimental work because you can reprogram it. Uh, if you want to produce 10,000 of your devices, then an FPGA will not be a good idea because it will be too expensive. But uh, it may be a good idea to develop the prototype on an FPGA, to test everything, to have the application ready, and then you have the code that you can give to the manufacturer of uh, the, the chip, and he may produce uh, for you uh, an application-specific chip that will do this, and it will be less expensive than if, if you produ produce that uh, in 10,000 quantities. So this is for development, uh, definitely not uh, for a high-volume application, like uh, for a car application when you manufacture million pieces a year. Questions? No questions? Okay.